It's time for this week's episode of Brandon Sports Talk, featuring in-depth interviews from those who are trending in the world of athletics. And now, here's the host of Brandon Sports Talk, Brandon Pate. Welcome back to Brandon Sports Talk. In today's episode, I have the privilege to interview the San Diego State's head women's lacrosse coach, Coach Kylie White. How are you doing today? I am fantastic. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Can you talk about how you knew that you wanted to get started in coaching in college women's lacrosse? Sure. Um, I kind of stumbled onto it, honestly. Uh, I was a high school coach and high school teacher for two years and didn't really know it was an option and doing summer camp some of my friends that had um that I was doing these camps with were like you know you should really get into college coaching and when I was a teacher I really loved the teaching aspect and I loved the coaching aspect so I'm like okay let's try this out so kind of what I did just started putting my name into some jobs and was lucky enough to get my start at Stanford. Of course, what was that like getting to play collegiate lacrosse for Ohio State? I loved every second of it. Just coming from Canada, the athletics is a little bit different. So um, when I arrived for my official visit and just saw the stadium and just what how they supported athletics I think um, I felt that instant pride from the community right away and so when I committed and when I finally arrived at OSU that was just something that I knew was part of being a, um, being a Buckeye you just you had to have that pride feel it and um, I was just so grateful every single day, like for the opportunity, because it was such a, a cool experience. Of course, what was that experience like being an international student athlete coming from Canada, going to Ohio State? Well, I was the first Canadian lacrosse player. So obviously my nickname was Canada for a little while. <laughs> uh, but really, it was, I feel like my eyes were just like bug eyed shooting out of my head for the entire time because I didn't understand like how cool it was um for your efforts to be um honored or rewarded just celebrated even um I just played for the most of my life just because I loved it and um it was something that I was naturally good at and obviously continued to work hard at but internationally coming over um it was just funny I think I don't it was, I'm not like a true international, like overseas or anything. I was actually closer than a lot of my teammates, only being five and a half hours away from Ohio. So I didn't really feel too out of place, except for my accent occasionally. Of course, what was that like getting to represent Ohio State and getting to put on that Ohio State lacrosse uniform? Yeah, for sure. Like, as I mentioned before, just the, the pride every time you put on Scarlet and Gray, uh, you could feel every single day the investment from the athletic department that they put in their athletes and uh, the people that you were surrounded by. So I, I knew that I was there for excellence, you know, winning championships. And so that professionalism that they provided to really gave me that pride every single time I stepped on the field, whether it was practice or for games, but I love, I loved putting it on. I just felt, like I was part of the whole athletic department. You know, we celebrate football and basketball a lot. Um, and that's what I came in, right? Football season before our season. So I just like, oh, this is how it is, no matter the sport. And that was the pride I also carried on. Of course, what was that like getting to compete against some of those teams in your conference, like Penn State and Michigan State? 
Um, I did not play against Mich Michigan State. So being an oldie, uh, the only true Big Ten teams were Penn State, um, gosh, Northwestern eventually, but there wasn't, Michigan didn't have a team, Michigan State, uh, gosh. Yeah, so it was, it was kind of different. We were in the American Lacrosse Conference for a little while, um, but when I was there, we weren't in a conference at all. So it was very tough to get to the NCAA tournament, and there was no clear path like there is now. You win a Big Ten tournament, you get to go to NCAAs. For us, we didn't have a conference at all, and we were always jealous of all the other sports because they got their Big Ten backpack, backpacks and all the, the cool things from going to their conference tournament, but we didn't have that at the time. Of course, what were some of your collegiate accomplishments at Ohio State? Um, well, as a, a team, we made it to the NCAA tournament for the very first time. It was a younger program, and um, my senior year, that was that was the goal. And we had such a great group of leaders. My class was just so connected, and I felt like the underclassmen were just totally bought in. So that was a huge deal for us to make it to the tournament for the first time. And as I said, not having a conference, that meant we had to get that at-large bid. Um, I guess another accomplishment was I was a two-sport athlete, which was really hard. Um, I played hockey my sophomore year on the inaugural women's ice hockey team, which was a wild time in my life. Um, but being a part of two newer programs was really cool just being a part of the culture and creating something um for you know the ones before me the ones after that was just a, a really neat experience of course what was that experience like as you said being a part of the lacrosse but also being a part of the ice hockey what was that experience like being part of there <laughs> exhausting um i look you know that the seasons overlap a lot. And so I started actually with lacrosse, then took a break for the hockey season, and then was doing two practices a day in from January through March, I believe. So I, my body was just like toast. I don't know. I was just running on fumes at that point. But as I said, it was just a neat experience to see how the two different programs were run and uh, hockey having, I guess, just a, a conference in Minnesota and um, just a little bit further away. We traveled a ton and um, the amount of equipment and, again, being a part of an inaugural team, it was really, really special. How was that a transition like from going from college lacrosse to then playing for the national team for Canada? I think I actually got better with age. Um, college is when I received my first, you know, experience of playing lacrosse every single day. So I didn't have a high school team. The closest team for me to play on in high school was three, four hours away. So um, it really prepared me for the rigors of a national team and also um, I mean, playing for your, your national team is just, I think any athlete grows up kind of hoping and wishing they get to put on that national team jersey and the pride that you get of representing something bigger than yourself. And, you know, I always wanted to be Olympian, but I'm about five, two. So, um, options were kind of limited on that, but every single time, um, you step on the field and hear your national anthem, beginning of the game it's just chills because it's such a cool cool thing and I was part of the national team program since I was uh 16 was my first world championship and so I guess 20 20 some years so I ended in 2013 so most of my life um at that time had been 
within that national team program. And that was really a challenge. Like when, when I retired of like kind of figuring out who I was after that. Of course, what was that feeling like getting to put on that national team and having the Canada Maple Leaf flag on you? I think, I mean, there was, again, like I said, you know, you're not just talking about Canadian pride in the country. Um, I, I think a lot about the people who helped get me there, of my family, my friends, of the people that helped um, fund my national team quest, I suppose. Uh, it's very expensive for lacrosse, or it was. Again, back in my day, we had to fundraise for everything. There's a lot more funding now for the national team programs, but at the time, um, we were basically paying for everything. So I think there was also a little bit of um, self pride of like all the knowing all the things it took to get to that spot, like the hard work with training on your own, not having trainers. Um, and then again, like the funding of like going out and trying to find ways to get you to training camps and get you um, to those after world championships. But all in all, I mean, playing for Canada was uh, the biggest highlight of my life. Of course, what was, that a, what was that experience like getting to coach on the Canada 19U team as an assistant coach? It was, I mean, I was pretty young. And I think at the time, I just wanted to give, give back. And it was so rewarding seeing those athletes going through what I what I went through I guess um the U19 was sort of I tried out myself on a whim I guess and so being able to help those girls like maybe lead them into their next phase like continuing on to the senior national team or on to the collegiate level I think just being a part of that process was extremely rewarding and why I'm excited to be back on staff for the U20 team that's going to Hong Kong in 2024 um I just I just know that it was it put my career in motion and I love teaching I love um the connection, the rela relationship with those young athletes. So it it was pretty uh, – it was a lot of work, much harder than being an athlete, I'll be honest. Like, but it was extremely rewarding to see those girls, like, find success at, at a high level. Of course, how was that like getting into college coaching and first getting your start at Stanford as the assistant coach? It was, um, well, I mean, Stanford, everyone knows, such an amazing place. Um, so for it to be my first place to start my career, I was very fortunate because I was alongside, like, Olympians, national champions, um, world champions. So the people that I, were, I was surrounded by daily and who were so open to – guide each other in becoming better as a coach or as an athlete I mean every day I just felt motivated and involved so I loved my time there and those athletes were so special to me the things that they were doing you know like inventing a robot and then coming to practice and working on you know emotion offense like it was just crazy to, to work with such unique humans but Stanford is is a special place for sure. Of course, while at Stanford, what were some of your biggest coaching accomplishments? Uh, I honestly, it's kind of funny. Um, one of the greatest accomplishments was also getting to that coveted NCAA tournament. It, it was the first time for the program, and you know we won a couple MPSF championships before the Pac-12 was formed. But our that program, Stanford, had not been to that NCAA tournament. So to get that first bid, unfortunately, we had to fa face Northwestern um, in the first round. But bringing that um, notoriety or to the program and just 
setting the stage like nationally that this is a team that you're going to have to compete with for the rest of your lives was pretty cool. Of course, as a coach, what was that feeling like getting that call from your alma mater of Ohio State to return back to join the coaching staff? I I love Ohio State. I love um, uh, it was my head coach that was still working there and my best friend. So the opportunity to go back was exciting. Every time you step on campus, especially as an alum, you get that feeling of uh, nostalgia and all the just excitement of being a Buckeye. So it it was really cool. Um, it was different than I thought. Um, you know, as an athlete, you go, you just kind of go in and it's all about you. And so when you come back as a coach, it's hard sometimes to separate that athlete part of the school. Um, you know, I, I think I put, I wanted them to have the same experience I did, but that isn't necessarily fair. Um, but I loved trying to have them, like those athletes would really love everything about Ohio State, you know, have that pride every single time they stepped on the field, wearing that jersey, like all those things were, I think, more my focus. And really, it was just, yeah, it, it, just, it will always be a special place in my heart. Of course, for you, what was that transition like going to Ohio State? and getting to step onto the sidelines from your time being a player and playing on the field? It was, um, like I said, it was a little bit confusing. You know, you want to, how do I phrase this? Um, I, I think I wanted, I wanted to be on the field, honestly, <laughs> but um I think I had an idea in my head of how things were supposed to be. And that maybe hindered me at the time, you know, like I recognize that now that the way I coached in that moment might not have been um, the best. I think my strength though is my ability to connect with athletes. So in that regard, like I, I wanted to connect with them, but I think there was too much pressure for me to on them from me because I wanted them to be um, not me necessarily, but I wanted them to be what my senior class was. And that was just like hard on, on myself. It's very confusing. I, I can't really articulate what I'm trying to say, but I, I think I was like swirling a little bit of trying to figure out like, how do I, let them be who they are and guide them to that success without them trying to be me. If that makes sense. While at Ohio State, what was that experience like getting to see those players put on that same uniform that you put on as a player? And I think it's just pride. You know, these are the people that I helped create a culture for and felt as an alumni that you know you want the team to do well so seeing them put on the jersey um I just felt pride of like okay these are the people we're preparing to continue something that we started that I have so much pride in so it was it was fun and again I wish I was in the, the jersey myself <laughs> of course how was your transition like from going from Ohio State your alma mater to then coaching at Loyola as the assistant coach? Well, the transi transition was very exciting. Loyola having such an amazing history, having gone to national championship before. And then um, I was really excited to coach alongside Jen Adams, who was going to take over the program. Um, she and I have been competing against each other for a really long time. We were both in that U19 and 1995 and just had competed against each other on um, Canada and US, or Australia for many years. So she and I knew each other and Jen being one of the greatest of all time, I was just 
excited to like tap into her brain and um, watch her do what she does and learn from her. And then Dana Doby being one of the the greatest as well, like a national teammate, but having the opportunity to also like just watch and learn from them and then feel like I was a part of something that could be back to national contention was extremely exciting for me and the hotbed of lacrosse. Like I hadn't been in on the East coast. I've been in the West and the Midwest. So being a part of, you know, a, a school with history and um, in the hotbed of lacrosse and it was just, something that I hadn't experienced before and I wanted to add that to my repertoire or my like my experience as I you know was trying to become a head coach myself. Of course what were some of the things that you learned there to then help you to one day become a head coach? I think there was a lot of um, professionalism and organization and um, like a winning mentality Jen and, and Dana, like we helped bring Loyola back in on the winning side for the records. Um, just the way that Jen approached every single practice um, and how she constantly was thinking about reinventing the game. And I, I just felt like I learned so much about what to do, you know, a lot of coaching and throughout the years of having coaches like what to do, what not to do. And that was a great place for me um, to set me up for the next stage. Of course, as a coach, what was that transition like from going from the West Coast to the East Coast and back to the West Coast to get your head coaching job? I think it was easy because I felt more like a West Coast west coast girl than an east coast girl um east coast is fast paced and um you know honk get out of my way kind of thing and then i felt like i was a more of a a chill vibe here on the west coast um it wasn't that tough of a transition really i i do think that the strangest feeling though is when you're on the east like everyone knows everything about everybody like and now that I'm on the west coast we're kind of just doing our thing there's no one around like within two two hours is the closest team so I just feel like there's a little bit of a disconnect of what we're doing and knowing what other people are doing positive and negative but it's been a pretty easy transition I'd say to be in San Diego of course what was that feeling like getting to become the next head coach for San Diego State I mean, it's scary. You think as an assistant, you know all the things you've been watching. You have all these experiences. You do all these tasks, you know, recruiting and and, um, travel. And, you know, there's all the nuances of things. But really, when you become the head coach, there are so many things that you just don't realize um, that are involved and just things you you can't cross off things off your list because you're in a meeting or you're putting out a fire here. Or, you know, there was, um, there was a lot, there's a huge learning curve, I will say, but I was, I was excited. I was passionate. I was definitely scared. And I think that those are all good things to help create a program because I was motivated. You know, it was an awesome opportunity that I wasn't going to pass up. Of course, after that press conference being announced as the next head coach, what was that feeling like getting to step onto that field for the first time for San Diego State? Uh, the, I mean, it was initially very like, okay, where do I start? Because obviously I was starting a new program and I literally was all by myself figuring out how to buy pens and a computer and goals and how to find players. So, like I said, it was a little bit overwhelming and where do I start? But I was extremely motivated and excited, like a hardworking person. So um, I was up to the task, but it was, it was a, a little bit of like drinking out of a fire hose for a little bit. Like I didn't, I just was moving. So I didn't even have an opportunity to like really realize what was happening because I just 
didn't have the ability to stop, if that makes sense. Of course, how is that feeling like being the inaugural coach for San Diego State's women's women's lacrosse program? Can you repeat that, sorry? Mm -hmm. What was that feeling like being the first coach for San Diego State's women's lacrosse program? Uh, pride, you know, just knowing that, you know, I was the first and I, again, a little bit nervous, right? Scared that um, I have an opportunity here to make something great. I don't want to mess it up. So there was a little, there's all the emotions, I suppose. I'm just like, what a, but more than anything, I'd say excitement and I did a lot of, I, I walked around and went to a lot of practices here, you know, watched basketball practice, watched football practice, softball, you name it, and really just tried to take in what the culture was at San Diego State and build, try to build my team's culture off of that. And, and really what it came down to, like, is that feeling of um, a family from this department. Can you talk about, of course, the culture that you've built for the San Diego Women's Lacrosse Program? The culture we've built here is based on family. So I, I purposely brought in a very young class of so the 20 freshmen, I believe. And my idea surrounding that was that I would, they would have no clue of what college was like. So I got to basically tell them and say, this is what it is. This is how you act. This is um, what college is about. And so from there, um, taking from Coach Fisher, you know, the legendary basketball coach and the Coach Dutcher, you know, this place is about people. So putting that back into our culture of you take care of each other, doesn't matter what, um, where you're from, how much scholarship you're on, how long you've played, you know, it's about each other. And we, I wanted best friends off the field so they can be best friends on the field. Um, that pride that I felt from Ohio State, you know, go to everyone's matches, you know, like go to soccer, go to water polo, support everyone so that you can truly feel connected with this department, that it wasn't just about the lacrosse team. It was something bigger, like support your friends. And I think that's what's carried on is that our team is loud. They are um, asked to come to important games because we have a presence uh, and uh, they care about each other. They really, they do, they love each other and it doesn't matter what grade they're in. They just have each other's back and that, that makes every day showing like, and they work hard for each other. They love the weight room. And so that makes, you know, showing up for work fun every day. Of course, what are some of the game day traditions that you've helped to implement for the San Diego State program? Game day traditions. Well, they've they've made a few of their own for sure. Um, but we have a fun game that we play. It's called pipe game. So before every game, we go and everyone gets one shot. And you have to try and hit the pipe. Um, but other traditions that I'd say we use are these these sticky notes. So pink is positive. Blue is buddy, green is grateful. So constantly having them say something positive about themselves or something that they're grateful for, and then share that positivity on to a buddy where they just, you know, tell them, you know, thanks for pushing me today in practice or, hey, you had my back in um, whatever it is. But I think just continuing to create those traditions of support um we start every fall with a bonfire bring in new families so that they can bond and connect because it is it's more than just the athletes that I have every day on the field like the families are a huge part of their support system which is really helpful for us as a coaching staff like we need support for the things that we they don't always care you know like they're going to tell their parents some things so being on the same page and feeling connected. But yeah, I think it all comes back to that family atmosphere. 
as a head coach, do you have any game day routines and rituals before game day? For myself, um, I would say I write out my my lineup, my pregame speech, I go through it. And then usually by the time I get into the locker room, I'm just winging it. So that's kind of how I prepare. Um, I have my game day shoes. Like I think lacrosse coaches are pretty swaggy. Like that. We have to have our, our cool shoes. Um, but I just like to, to relax a little bit. Try not to overthink. I can't watch the warm up because I'll just, you know, start to freak out a little bit. So I just try and, yeah, stay loose, stay positive, stay energized, because I, I think the athletes really do um, feed off of coaches' energy. So I'm mostly trying to stay relaxed and confident so that they also feel that vibe when they step up on the field. Who are some of the teams that you face in your conference each week? Well, next year we'll be joining the Pac-12 for the first time. So we were conference-less for the last three years, I believe. We were in the MPSF, and then um, the MPSF dissolved when the Pac-12 formed. So now that we'll be in the Pac-12 next year, we'll be seeing Stanford, USC, Cal, Oregon, Davis, Boulder, ASU. Uh, Yeah, great, great group uh, representing the West Coast. Of course, what would that feel like, obviously, getting to play against those teams like Oregon, UCLA, Stanford? Um, we've, I mean, we've been playing them for the last 10 years, 12 years that we've had a program. So I think the only difference is knowing that it is, it leads to something. So the top six out of the eight go to the conference tournament. So playing with a little bit more um, focus on this matters to get to that conference tournament. I think that creates more rivalries and more intensity, which I'm pretty excited about. What is that home game atmosphere like when teams like Stanford and Oregon come versus going to UCLA and playing them at UCLA? So UCLA doesn't have a team, but USC, um, the, I like our environment here because our we have a fence that's basically up along the boundary. And so fans can hang over the fence. And I think there's a, a home field advantage just to, um, you know, the fans can get a little bit loud. And so I think that's exciting when we um, get those teams here just to put a little extra pressure on them. Um, but it it's something that, is in the future that we are creating a more an actual lacrosse only stadium. So that will be really exciting that have that home that really feels um, a little bit more enclosed and like a professional feel. Of course, what does that recruitment process look like for those prospective student athletes looking to play collegiate lacrosse? We share the responsibility of identifying um athletes I think our, our the way that our coaching staff looks at um prospective student athletes you know we're looking for that complete player athletic um good teammate you know the ability to see space lacks IQ and we do a lot of research on who that player is as a person um I think they're the when you create a culture, you're very cognizant of the people that you bring into your program because you want to keep that culture what it is. And, we, you know, the one bad apple kind of thing, you were really trying to avoid that situation um, of someone coming in and disrupting that. But I think the, the main thing is watching athletes having that next place be, you know, make a mistake, go out there play just hard and fast and then if you make a mistake just react to it in the right way and I think that is more attractive to collegiate coaches versus just doing the right thing all the time and playing cautious like we want people who are willing to shoot a gap or like 
throw a path maybe that's a little bit tricky or a little bit fancy and and see what works and what doesn't and then and kind of learn from that so I think that's really um what we do is we just start identifying kids who are putting themselves out there and then over the course of their sophomore year just like keep watching them grow and then the summer going into their junior year really narrowing the list down and figuring out who we're going to be calling September 1st and yeah starting the the process of the get to know you process like the the dating game if you will of course for those prospective student athletes what does that official visit look like at San Diego State we are as I said like it's about people and we are very appreciative of people taking the time to come west so we make sure that that day is jam-packed full of um information so they get to have alone time with our team so they can sit down and just ask any question um without the coaches there so they can get like a true picture of what's really happening um they'll meet with academic advisors we'll do a campus tour um photo shoot sometimes um Test out the food on campus because that's super important too. But check out a football game or a soccer game, depending on who's home at that on that weekend. But it's usually just really emerging the the perspective of student athlete into the campus feel, seeing if it's the right fit for them, like being that far away from home. Do they feel like they mesh with the student athletes? Like these are the people you'll spend every waking moment with. Like, is there, do you vibe at all? And then obviously, do you have a connection with the coaches? Like we're really the ones like the moms away from your mom. So making sure that you feel comfortable with us every single day. As a head coach, what are some of the things that you look at in those prospective student athletes when out on the road recruiting them? We, as I mentioned before, just like looking for that willingness to take risks, fail, um, be a good teammate, communication. We see interactions between student athlete and parents. Um, you know, you're at big tournaments and you just kind of watch. And sometimes, you know, you'll see some really awesome interactions like really love and, and then other times you'll see some things where you're like just mark down the number and be like you know that's not something I want to bring into my program but we're looking you know for good people and on the road that's really in those stressful moments or when the people's true colors sometimes shine and that's where we we make a little note. As a head coach what is it like seeing those freshmen put on that San Diego State jersey for the first time? I'm so like just excited for them because they're starting the best four years of their, their life. So for us, you know, it's, um, it's like a proud mama moment where you really feel like you had some, and you do have some role in this person's life and you brought them here and for them to see their dreams come true. It's just really gratifying. Um, because you're happy for them. You're like, you you did it, you got here and you want them to have that same pride that you have every time, you know, like when every time I put on my jersey, like that, have that same feeling um, that you're part of something really cool. What is that like as a head coach to see those freshmen put it on for the first time, but the seniors putting it on for the last time? Oh gosh. Um, you know, every every year it just gets a little bit. You think it would get easier, but it doesn't. Um, I'm so at the end of four years. I I'm typically uh, very emotional. Um, I'll, I always thank my mom for that emotional dean that I have. But I I just like thank those athletes for what they've given us, what they've given this program, their teammates for four years, because it, I know that it's a lot of work and we expect a lot of them every single day. And so it's a little bit bittersweet because I'm excited for them 
to head on into the next phase of their life. But I'm also super sad to see them go because you, by their senior year, you've really created a, um, a bond that goes beyond the lacrosse field. And yeah, so it, it, it's sad, but it's also like really like I'm happy to see that um, they're going to go on and do great things in their life and that we were a part of that. What is it like to see those seniors go on from playing collegiately to then going to play professionally, whether it's Athletes Unlimited or in the national team? I mean, it is so amazing that there is an opportunity for them to continue playing, honestly. Um, The Athletes Unlimited has really proven to be um, a model that can be find you can find success you can have the ability to continue playing uh they tried professional leagues for a long time that just weren't taking off and weren't sustainable so for there to be an option I think it's awesome I think we're really at a place in our sport where we are showing that it it is one of the the coolest games out there and for my athletes might just try it you know keep working a lot of times national teams and professional are just um the people who still have that passion to play and work hard so if that's something that they don't want to give it up yet at least there is an opportunity for them to continue playing as a head coach what is it like seeing your players go on from being collegiate athletes to then getting into coaching god such a sense of pride i feel like it means I didn't scare them too much in um, what our lives look like but I think having someone go into the coaching world you know just means that we've helped them um, find something that they love at when they're at San Diego State like a passion for this game that they want to share with others Um, and for those that haven't gone into coaching collegiately but have gone on to coach high school it's the same thing you know they've taken their skills that they've learned here and are really playing an even bigger role of growing the game and um, helping these young athletes excel as a person and a player. And I, I'm just, I love when they call and ask for drills and um, just such, such pride. Of course, what are some of your future plans for the lacrosse program moving forward? Well, as I mentioned, we're joining the pac well so that is very exciting that starts this fall um we're as i also mentioned the athletic department is super on board with growing uh our our sport here so adding that lacrosse only stadium is a huge deal uh but we have goals that we haven't met yet. You know, we need to get to that NCAA tournament. We have a, a more a clear path now having that NC, sorry, having that Pac-12 tournament. But we haven't really reached that goal yet. And I know for me, I'm not going to be satisfied until we get there and we are a national contender yearly. Of course, as a head coach, what will that feeling be like to get to step into your lacrosse stadium for the first time versus when you stepped onto the lacrosse field for the first time oh gosh like when we played at the snapdragon this year that field of professionalism I, it just elevated our game and the girls and coaches like we just had so much fun i think that when we get our stadium that feeling of this is our house like really no one else is on it like you can it just creates a, a different sense of pride and like you know we don't lose here you know I'm, I'm excited for that feeling uh it will be a f- couple years from now so we gotta continue to win on the, our current field but I'm I'm excited to be using that as a recruiting tool to bring people and be like no let's let's be part of getting this program to that next level and it's gonna be really fun what advice would you have for those collegiate athletes that are looking to play college lacrosse? What advice would you give? High school sorry, athletes. That, sorry? What advice would you have those high school athletes looking to play college lacrosse? Go for it. I mean, there's a place for everyone. There's so many teams out there. It doesn't have to be in the 
yes, those top 10 programs. I think there was a time where everyone just, you know, set their sights on those programs and you can play your best lacrosse anywhere. It's really like what you put into it. So look and see, you know, where you want to be in the country. What do you want to major in? You know, where you feel like you're going to be um, competitive because I think there are so many opportunities that sometimes we get a little narrow-minded based on external um, influences, we'll say. Um, but keep working hard. If you want something, go after it. What advice would you have those freshmen entering their first year of collegiate lacrosse? Don't wait to be great. It's something that I say to them all the time. There's, uh, as a coach, you want you want freshmen to play. You want to have them for four years. So when they're hitting their senior year, you've got four years of experience from them, and that's going to not only help um, build your program, but also have that experience in tough situations they're confident they know what to do so go out there no one's holding them back except themselves so let go of whatever they're holding on to and just go out and play free you get you get sort of leniency on making mistakes because you're a freshman so use that to your advantage to grow and test yourself and and continue to be the like find what kind of athlete you're going to be what if i switch you those collegiate athletes that are looking to play professionally whether it's for the national team or athletes on the minute? Yeah, put yourself in the situation. I think just keep working. Honestly, um, as I mentioned before, if you are willing to do the work and believe in what you are capable of, someone's going to feel that and support you. So why not go for it? What advice would you have those collegiate athletes looking to get into college coaching after their collegiate career? Just know what it what it takes. I think um, it's a much harder profession than people realize. Um, it's not your typical nine to five. You know, you have the weekends, you have summers or traveling, and it's hard finding that work life balance. But it's also one of the best jobs out there. Um, the connections you get with your student athletes, the the people you meet along the way just knowing you're changing lives through sport, but like affecting them for the rest of their life in other ways. I mean, honestly, it's, it is the best job out there, but it does require sacrifice and a lot of hours. What advice would you give those people that are looking to coach at their own like you have? Uh, enjoy it. I think just go and um, try and separate yourself from those athletes I think uh putting the pressure on them to be who you were when you were there is not fair so just being able to transfer over your pride for the program in a way that builds up those athletes and um is prideful versus pressure I think that's where I missed the mark so go in enjoy it and just share that pride and, and sort of embrace it together and move forward. What advice would you those assistant coaches transitioning from being assistant to head coach? Ooh, uh, it, it's, it's a grind. And I think overnight success is not, um, I think there's a lot of pressure in being a head coach and that you don't realize, you know, every decision comes with a little bit more weight and use your, your support staff, um, use, yeah, use your assistants, use people who've coached you before and don't, don't let it weigh you down. I think emotions really got the best of me in my first first game as a, a college coach because it happened to be at Stanford versus Ohio State so I was a little bit emotional and so my judgment might have been a little bit clouded through all the things that I was feeling but I think just taking some time breathe and realize what you're doing is um is important but it doesn't need to be 
an overnight success. So just take your time, enjoy the journey. Um, it's not about the destination, especially as you start. What advice would you those head coaches looking to build their own program and build their own legacy? Be confident in who you are and what you want from your program. I think I am so grateful that the advice I got was about building that culture because that has, as I mentioned, like I'm, I'm excited to come to work today because I love the people that I'm working with. I love my athletes. And that was a culture that was created early on. So I would say take the time to build it the way you want to build it and trust your gut, not always looking to other people for how they would do it, but using like, there's a reason why you got to the spot you're at. So trust, trust yourself and you got to be happy with it. That's great advice. So where can my listeners find you at on social media along with the San Diego State Women's Lacrosse Program at? Um, the San Diego State is Aztec WLAX. And then I think I'm Kylie underscore. Wait, I don't even know my handle. Is that embarrassing or what? <laughs> um, goodness gracious. I think I'm just Kylie White, to be honest. Yep. A-Y-L-E-E-W-H-I-T-E. But I'm not so good at the Instagram. I I think that um, my assistants, they're a little bit younger. They're, they're much more um, capable of putting up material than I. Thank you again, Coach Kylie White, for your interview. And best of luck in your future at San Diego State as the head women's lacrosse coach. Thank you, Brian. It's been fun. Thank you. You can find Brandon Sports Talk on Instagram at Brandon Sports Talk, Twitter at Talk underscore Brandon, and you can find me on YouTube at Brandon Sports Talk. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you again, Coach Kaylee White, for your interview, and best of luck in your future. Thank you. You've been watching Brandon Sports Talk. Please feel free to like, share, and subscribe to Brandon Sports Talk on social media and on YouTube.